Clock started. All right. Greetings again, everybody. Here we are, getting close to the end of the course. The end is in sight, at least. Um, this is the last set of slides uh, before exam three, and what happens before exam four is pretty short. So we're getting there. We're getting there. Um, this section is on, of course, groups, interests, and civil engagement. Um, Lowy chapter 12, Katz Nelson chapter 5, Invect in chapter 10, plus the inequality for all film um, that you can watch this week. Uh, but anyway, uh, this photo is from an earlier edition of the Lowy textbook, but I've, I've just always liked this. You are not alone. This goes back to the, uh, the uh, Occupy Wall Street protests uh, that actually began in Spain. Um, and I was there when that happened and got roughed up by the cops as I was protesting in Barcelona. Um, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, I just like this. You are not alone. The little play on words there. Um, the current edition, the 16th edition of Lowy opens uh, with uh, a discussion of Citizens United and the increase uh, Supreme Court decision that was made in 2010 that basically legalized uh, a lot of outside spending in um, federal campaigns. Um, so here we are. This is uh, Chuck Schumer, the leader of the Democrats in the Senate. Um, not happy about it, not happy about the increase in spending, in this case, particularly by the NRA, which I'll talk about a time or two again before the end of uh, these slides. So anyway, let's talk about the push and pull of groups and interests, right? There's a push and a, there's a pull and a push organizing political activity in the United States, right? The government uh, wants to gather information on how decisions will impact various constituents or constituencies. This should be bipartisan, both uh you know, the party in power and the opposition, whichever one party is at the time, should be interested in knowing what people think, right? Um, there's a push from individuals and groups to seek to gain some benefit. This can be multi-directional uh, as you know, not, uh, not any two parties are inherently opposed to each other. Uh, no two parties, that are, um, sorry, I said parties, I meant um, interest groups. Um, are necessarily completely opposed to each other uh, or are completely on the same page. So this can really be uh, multi-directional. But when, when we're talking about parties in government and in, and in opposition and interest groups who obviously by definition are not in government but seek to influence it, uh, we're talking about pluralism at work here, right? Uh, and again, we talk about interest groups. We talk, also talk about about individuals uh, representing interest as well, right? I mean, the, in the United States, in theory, there's room for everyone to participate in political debate. That's that's what we aim for as a society. That's what we tell ourselves uh, exists, even though, you know, as we know well, not all voices are heard equally, um, which is kind of the theme of the Katz Nelson book. Um, but pluralism, uh, the pluralist system that we define in the United States um, is one in which groups and interests and ideas coexist within the same political system uh, and compete over and share power in a roundabout way, right? So long as groups are free to organize, the system is arguably democratic, right? As our, us as individuals, we're free to join groups that we support and we will not join groups that we oppose, right? Um, it stands to reason logically that bigger groups will have more power. And then I put here, as they should, dot, 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 question mark, um, you know, it's like saying Folgers is hands down the best coffee in the United States because it, it's the, the coffee that leads the country in sales, right? That doesn't necessarily mean it's the best, most powerful coffee out there, right? Uh, just because a group has more members uh, or spends more doesn't mean that it necessarily has more power or should have more power, right? Um, but the fact of the matter is some groups do organize more easily than others. Um, you know, single issue groups, be it the NRA or be it um, you know, anti-abortion groups, uh, when you can rally around one policy issue that tends to make, uh, groups more organized and arguably more influential, right? Um, let's see, moving on here. An interest group is an organized group of individuals or organizations that makes policy related appeals to government, right? Um, and we tell ourselves that interest groups enhance democracy, uh, by representing individuals, encouraging political participation, and, and educating the public, right? Um, you know, a theme throughout this course has been, uh, you know, the problem with representation in government, 
Uh, and that I'm not trying to, to minimize or downplay that. That is indeed a problem. I think it is a problem uh, that needs redress. But at the same time, uh, in this pluralist system that we find ourselves in, in theory, we all can participate in it uh, in by participating with in interest groups, right? Um, but however, that's not to say that the interest group pathway is the perfect way to, um, again, redress the problem of representation as uh, interest groups are inherently private uh, and they, they ad advance and represent certain private interests and the interests of a few, not the public interest. The government is meant to function in the public interest. Interest groups, by definition, do not, right? Uh, and again, I stressed this earlier in the semester, uh, last week, I think, um, that interest groups do not seek to directly put their members in office. Once uh, a member of an interest group seeks office, that, that person is going to need to seek uh, the help of a political party uh, to find themselves uh, into office, right? So there, again, to reiterate a point from earlier, um, is what we're, we're saying, right? The difference between interest groups and political parties. Um, organized interests are primarily economic, right? Economic interests are one of the main purposes for which uh, we form groups, uh, particularly to group, we form groups that are meant to protect our economic interests. And we could be, uh, say, farmers, uh, the American Farm Bureau Federation, the AFL-CIO is a labor union. Uh, we could talk about the American Medical Association, which represents doctors, Americans for Tax Reform, uh, which could represent just about anybody, but ultimately uh, it is a group that is meant to, they, who, whose goal is to just obliterate, abolish taxation at the federal level. Uh, this guy's named uh, no Oliver Nordquist. Uh, he is the guy who founded uh, Americans for Tax Reform. Uh, my last example here. He is, uh, he's been around for quite a while. Um, you'll often see him on Fox News and such, but um, he will tell you that taxes are all bad and we should just get rid of them and somehow the government will go on um, without taxing the people. Um, but he's a pretty influential uh, interest group leader. Right. Uh, and he will uh, go after even Republicans, uh, particularly in primaries for uh, Congress, if he feels like um, whatever Republican candidate is an anti-tax. But anyway, um, problem with uh, interest groups, and it's not a problem with interest groups, maybe a problem for interest groups, are that uh, when a group is successful, it can't it can't keep others from benefiting from, non-members from benefiting from what the group does, right? So inactive individuals, or we call them free riders, enjoy the benefits of collective goods, even though they did not participate in acquiring them. I have examples, question mark here, we would flesh this out where we in class together, but um, what I'm thinking about here is say, for example, um, someone working in a, an industry in which there is a labor union and that person benefits from what the labor union um, manages to achieve uh, for everyone working in the industry, even though not everyone working in the industry has to be a member of the union, right? So if you're not a dues paying member of a union, but benefit from something a union has done, you would be a free rider, right? And there's no legal way um, to prevent free riders from, from existing or from benefiting from what um, interest groups are able to attain. Um, but, you know, it gets back to something we talked about earlier in the semester, um, public goods, right? The government is left to, to finance public goods like streetlights and sidewalks and, and uh, the military and uh, lighthouses because there's no economic incentive uh, for a private interest to, to build these things. Uh, and free riders are also ones who benefit from those. Um, so anyway, this, is, this is an issue that's come up before. But anyway, again, not necessarily a bad thing. Um, if a group is complaining about free riders benefiting from what it does, then that group has probably been pretty successful. Uh, but anyway, organizational components. So groups appeal to members by offering them certain benefits, right? So groups also uh, try to attract non-members to join by offering, offering them these things, right? Informational benefits, um, training programs and conferences and such, material benefits, such as goods, services, and discounts. Uh, say, you know, if you're a member of the teachers union, you get a discount at the bookstore or something. Um, social benefits, such as networking and uh, purposive benefits, 
um, which has to do with purpose. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly, damn it, Larson. Um, but uh, such accomplishments, right? Actual legislative accomplishments in particular. Um, you know, the, the NRA is pretty good at providing um, purposive benefits uh, to its members because the status quo just doesn't change. And that in and of itself is an accomplishment of that particular um, interest group, right? Um, when I mentioned material benefits, uh, the AARP has come up in previous slides before, I know it has, the uh, formerly known as the American Association of Retired Persons now just goes by the acronym AARP, uh, or the uh, alphabet soup listing there, AARP. Uh, that woman there is a national treasure. If you don't recognize who that is, her name is Betty White. She's in her 90s uh, as a TV comedian and has been involved in television since like the 50s. Um, but she, for a time, was the spokesperson for AARP. And I guarantee you that uh, my grandmother uh, knows exactly who uh, this woman is and uh, AARP and having Betty White uh, endorsing that group uh, was probably a good thing. But I, I, I put here under material benefits the AARP because um, there are a lot of uh, discounts in particular that come with AARP membership. If you can uh, uh, provide an AARP membership card, ask my parents. Uh, you get benefits uh, or discounts like on hotels and rental cars and things like that. Um, so these are, uh, again, material benefits that interest groups can offer uh, to members. Um, let's see. What do interest groups need? Well, they need money, membership, and members, obviously. Uh, groups need money to sustain what they do, obviously. Lobbying. I'll talk about lobbying in a minute. Uh, voter education, trying to get people to vote the way the groups want them to, et cetera. Uh, groups with access and organizational discipline are more successful. And by access, I mean particularly access to policy makers, uh, be them members of Congress or uh, bureaucrats in the federal bureaucracy or the president uh, himself. I say himself because they've only been hymns up to now. Um, groups with more members are often more powerful. Uh, and I will return to the AARP, formerly the American Association of Retired Persons I've already mentioned. Uh, it's powerful because it represents so many active voters and they could be free riders. Not every retired person, and I think you can join as soon as you're like 50 or 55, um, but uh, you don't have to officially join. You don't have to pay dues necessarily uh, to benefit from what the AARP does. Now, you might have to be a member to get the discounts, but you don't have to be a member to benefit from, say, uh, the non-privatization of Social Security, which was uh, attempted by George Bush, uh, George W. Bush in 2005 after being reelected in 2004. And uh, the AARP, which includes a lot of Republicans, right, because we know older people tend to be more conservative. Uh, the AARP was well against this. Uh, the privatization of uh, a percentage of social, the social security system. Uh, and, uh, you know, every retired person has benefited from that, right? Free riders, uh, some of them. Uh, characteristics of group members. Uh, this should not surprise us. People with higher incomes and higher levels of education tend to be members of, of interest groups. They tend to vote in higher numbers. They just tend to be more politically active. And we've talked about this already. Uh, there's thus an upper class and thus an older and whiter bias in the interest group system. Um, you know, Katz Nielsen, anyone? Um, this has been kind of a theme throughout the Katz Nielsen text. Uh, so again, this should not surprise us. And I had data on this from Katz Nielsen last time around uh, that showed you by quintiles, how people participated, uh, wealth quintiles, um, how people participated in the political system, right? So while the bottom rungs of the socioeconomic ladder are represented by some groups, Parties often do a better job of representing these interests, whether that is, um, you know, you can make a case that uh, the Democratic Party does this. You can make a case that the Republican Party uh, has tried to do this in recent years, right, representing those toward the bottom rungs of the socioeconomic ladder, right? Um, let's see, how and why do interest groups form? This is straight out of the old uh, Lowy textbook here, um, but you can see that interest groups themselves are pretty, pretty well skewed toward um, executives and professionals and white collar workers. Uh, white collar workers often means professionals. So I don't know. I mean, I, I could look up this book here, uh, by Schultzman, Verba and Brady, uh, and see what exactly they mean. Um, you know, what the difference is between a professional association and a white collar union. Um, but you can see that, uh, as a percent of organizations, 
Uh, if we add these three up, which basically overlap quite a bit, that number is through the roof, right? It's well over 90% uh, of groups that only represent, if you add up the column uh, here to the far right, around 10 to 11% of the population, right? Um, so that seems that seems pretty skewed, huh? Uh, ratio of orgs as percentage of adults, right? That that's 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 not a lot. It's not a lot. Um, so anyway, um, yeah, uh, the not in workforce here, the the uh, senior citizens organization, so the ARP would fall under this category here. Um, but you can see again, uh, the, the risk of repeating myself, which I never do, <clears throat> ask my wife. Um, you know, organizations tend to overrepresent uh, business groups. Here you have some different data uh, coming from, uh, well, actually, it comes from the same textbook. Here you can see the source, uh, the Schultzman, Verba, and Brady book. Um, so again, I don't know how. Uh, Katz Nelson is interpreting this, but this is straight out of the Katz Nelson text. And I, I, I show this uh, forgetting that it this was sourced from the same uh, textbook here, um, our textbook citing this, uh, the same book. Uh, but uh, I, I leave this in here just to stress the point that uh, business groups here uh, make up over half of interest groups uh, by organization type, right? So again, just to reiterate the point that um, you know, business interests tend to be well overrepresented um, in the political system, right? For better, or for worse. Uh, shifting gears to Van Vechten and shifting gears to individuals here. This is a nice little pyramid that is uh, straight out of the Van Vechten uh, chapter 10. Um, I don't have a page number here, uh, but it uh, doesn't matter. Um, actually, it's not in the in the short chapter I see, but uh, we'll we'll go through this list here very briefly. Um, you know, we can think of uh, engaging in terms of uh, what uh, a term that, that gets used sometimes is slacktivism, where you're basically just, you know, liking, disliking material on, on a Facebook page or following a politician on Twitter uh, to actually trying to in, influence how other people vote by getting them to sign petitions or by contacting your own representative, attending meetings, and as we move up, things start to get more expensive, right? Donating to campaigns, campaigning yourself, donating your time, uh, becoming uh, a local activist, a political activist, or a candidate yourself, right? So uh, a lot of different ways to be involved in in the system, right? And that, that pyramid on Californians really can apply to just about anybody in the United States. Here's the in brief summary. Um, we've covered pretty much all of this. Uh, I just leave this in here, as you know, for your your reference if you need it. Uh, let's think about how group activity reflects the political environment. And that could be, you know, the, the, the immediate environment in which one finds oneself at a particular place in the country. Uh, we could think about the, the political environment as a, as a time, whether that's 1968, uh, whether that is 2020, right? Um, but periods of significant change or social and economic upheaval usually signal a burst of group activity. Right. So we could identify group activity uh, as far back as the 1890s as government became more active in seeking to regulate interstate commerce. So this is where you started getting seeing business interests being really interested in what the federal government seeks to do, particularly how it seeks to, it sought to regulate commerce. Um, the federal government, of course, grew in the 1930s. We've talked about this already uh, in the context of uh, and consequence of the Great Depression. Uh, but this led to another burst of group activity. Uh, some people insisting that the government help them and then particularly conservative business interest uh, wanting the government uh, to limit itself uh, and its scope. Um, it's clear that uh, BLM, Black Lives Matter, took off in 2020. It existed prior. Um, but again, the period of, of uh, upheaval and change uh, really made it clear that Black Lives Matter as a movement is here to stay, uh, like it or not. Um, although I think it's safe to say that we could be uncertain as to the extent of the mobilization mobilization and change in the longer term. Um, but if you watch this link, this is uh, a monologue by uh, Trevor Noah um, of uh, The Daily Show uh, talking about uh, Black Lives Matter in it's a clip from June of 2020. Um, oh, by the way, I forgot to mention the previous hyperlink. I think it's on slide six or seven, but it's a good, um, it's a good, 
monologue uh, by Hassan Minaj of the Patriot Act on Netflix talking about the NRA and its global reach. So uh, getting beyond the borders of the United States. I'm sorry, I forgot to mention that earlier. Uh, but anyway, there are tens of thousands of groups at the federal, state, and local levels, um, logically. Um, and let's think particularly about the state level in California. Um, many students in semesters past have commented on uh, Van Vechten's discussion of the five Californias. This starts on page 150 of her book and really doesn't go on for too long, goes only on to page 153. But, uh, you know, this is uh, her, her proposed way to conceptualize the state by the 1% California, so the wealthiest of Californians, uh, elite California, Main Street California, uh, Humboldt falls into what she calls struggling California, uh, and then disenfranchised California in the middle. Um, particularly, you know, that's also agricultural California's uh, heartland. Um, but you can see by population where a majority of, of these Californians live. Um, but feel free to flesh out some of this data. Um, you know, think about how median personal income and uh, education uh, coincides with uh, life expectancy, for example, right? You can see that 1% California lives longer than disenfranchised California does, right? Uh, and you can see that um, we see corresponding uh, declines in education levels and, of course, income, right? And an increase in percentage of people living below the poverty line. So um, anyway, things to think about. I really want you to walk away from this class with a um, hopefully a, a more critical way of, of viewing the, the political world around you. Um, but you can probably guess uh, in the context of what we were just talking about, political participation and political environment, uh, that 1% California tends to be a lot more active uh, with its time and with its money than those who live in disenfranchised California, logically, right? Uh, sad realities of a political system that runs on dollars. Uh, but anyway, how do interest groups influence policy? Let's shift gears. We talk about insider strategies and outsider strategies. Insider strategies involve directly seeking to directly influence decision makers or pushing or pursuing advocacy through the courts, right? Um, we see this more so from more organized groups, larger groups, and wealthier groups. Outside strategies, uh, outsider strategies are those that tend to be employed by um, less organized and groups with less uh, economic resources. Uh, but these groups can seek, try to seek to educate the public because the public, of course, votes on those decision makers, right, above. Um, and outsider strategies can include in campaigning and contributing to candidates, particularly those who are not in office, right? Many groups pursue both insider and outsider strategies. And really the most effective groups uh, do both, whether that's the NRA, the AARP, what have you, right? Um, I've talked about in weeks past the March for Our Lives. Uh, kids uh, formed an interest group after the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas shooting uh, a couple, what, in 2018, I think that was. Um, when you're kids and you've never been involved in an interest group before, you probably don't have a lot of insider strategies to depend on, right? Put it that way. Uh, although they did try. They did try to contact um, a lot of uh, Congress people, which would be uh, an insider strategy. But when you're doing so as an outsider group, um, it's not as effective as, say, you know, the lobbyist for the NRA that has Congress people on speed dial. Uh, but anyway, let's talk about direct lobbying. Uh, this is an attempt by a group to influence the policy process through persuasion of government officials, and it costs billions of dollars a year. Businesses are willing to spend billions of dollars per year uh, to pay people to try to uh, get those people to effectively convince um, Congress people to vote on legislation the way um, these businesses want the legislation voted on, right? Uh, we tend to think of lobbying pretty negatively, has a negative connotation, um, but it is possible to claim, Lowy makes the claim, I don't necessarily agree, that lobbyists do make positive contributions to society by providing information uh, to us uh, voters and to policymakers, uh, and to make sure group concerns are heard. Uh, that is a beauty that lies in the eye of the be beholder, I think, right? Depending on your view of uh, guns and say what how you feel about gun control, uh, you're going to to you know think differently about concerns being heard by those in the NRA. You might be completely in agreement, and you might completely be against 
uh, such a group and such concerns, right? So uh, it, it can be pretty subjective here. So um, I don't know, me personally, uh, I'm not a big fan of lobbying. You know, I'm not a big fan of, of money in politics, but that's just the way uh, it is uh, in this country at present. So uh, lobbyists also seek to influence other parts of government by lobbying the president uh, or by lobbying the executive branch bureaucracy. Because again, the, the, we know that the executive branch bureaucracy, which is hard to say quickly, a lot of times fast, um, but we know that um, there's a lot of decision-making leeway that exists within that bureaucracy, right? Um, so groups can cultivate access to Congress or to government agencies within the executive branch over time. And again, we can look at different groups that have been more or less successful at this over longer periods of time. Um, interest group influence on politics. This is from uh, the newest edition of the textbook. Uh, this was President Trump, then President Trump, talking to business leaders about tax reform. Uh, in an earlier edition of the textbook, there is a photo of previous President Obama talking to business leaders about climate change. Um, why do I put these two photos in here of two different presidents talking to, in effect, the same groups or the same group? Uh, it's because group interests can also vary from time to time depending on who's in power, right? Businesses here in this case, talking to Obama, we're probably, we're probably talking a nice game about climate change, but not wanting the government to really do much about it. In the previous slide, I bet your, I bet my bottom dollar that uh, business groups were wanting, uh, encouraging uh, then President Trump to do what he could to reduce corporate uh, income tax. Uh, but anyway, speaking of, uh, here we have some data um, that really spells out uh, interest group influence on politics. This is 154 of Katz Nelson here. Um, and the context here is the discussion of the Dodd-Frank reforms, and this goes back way back when to after the economic crash of 2008-9, um, the number of meetings held with select federal agencies between consumer groups and representatives of major banks and banking groups, right? So uh, again, to sustain the Katz-Nelson theme here, uh, it seems like money to interest have money to interests have much easier and more frequent access uh, to uh, policymakers and thus insider strategies than consumer groups do, rightly or wrongly, right? Um, but that might help us to understand why uh, policy is the way it is in the United States, right? Um, here you see um, top spin, top uh, group influence on politics in California uh, from 2013 and 14. Sorry, I meant to change this out and put in some uh, more updated data, and I did not do that. Um, my apologies, but this list more or less appears, uh, a version of it on page 160. Um, the numbers have changed a bit, uh, but you can see nonetheless that the biggest industries that lobby in Sacramento and beyond uh, oil and gas, labor unions, business, government, health services. So, you know, you don't, please don't think of lobbying and spending on lobbying as 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 a left wing thing or a right wing thing, a, a Democrat thing or a Republican thing. It's definitely um, both sides of the aisle uh, are involved in this because it's the system that we have. Oh shoot, here we go. I forgot to take a slide out. I did put in the new information. I just didn't take out the previous slide. This uh, again, page one fifty of or 160 of the current Van Vechten uh, text updates the data a little bit to 2015 and 16. But again, oil and gas, health, labor unions, business, government, etc. cetera, um, a lot of money spent trying to get uh, policymakers in California to do what these uh, groups want done, right? That's just how it is. Uh, regulations on lobbying. There are rules. Uh, groups have to report what money is spent on lobbying, there are limits on gifts from lobbyists, lobbyists must register as lobbyists, you can't purport to be a lobbyist without registering with the state or federal government in question, um, which at the very least I think is a good thing. You know, politicians have to know you're a lobbyist and that's why you know you want to speak to them. But uh, recent reforms require lobbyists to disclose contribution information, but there are ways around that, right? Um, uh, what Another strategy that groups use is to go through the courts. You know, in the United States, we this is a very litigious society. We, we go to court all the time over lots of things. Um, and interest groups can seek to influence policy through the courts by bringing suits directly on behalf of their group, by financing suits brought by others, and then by filing amicus curiae briefs, which I explained 
uh, way back when we talked about the courts. Um, but this is uh, somewhat of an insider strategy. Um, but, um, you know, this is definitely a way to say, uh, take advantage of judicial review, which has been discussed uh, a couple times throughout the semester. But uh, say if groups don't like a new law that's passed, which has happened with the Affordable Care Act, uh, some three or four times, uh, three times, I believe, cases have made it to the Supreme Court by interests who want to do away with the Affordable Care Act, trying to get the Supreme Court to rule as such. And for three times, the uh, Supreme Court has ruled uh, in favor of the Affordable Care Act, ruling its its legality, its constitutionality, right? But um, interest groups who are against the Affordable Care Act have, see, have sought to influence policy by doing away with the federal, uh, the Affordable Care Act through the courts. Uh, and there's a long tradition of this. I mean, Brown versus Board of Education was a good example of cases brought by the NAACP to advance a social policy agenda. So, I mean, it cuts both ways. Again, this is not a strategy employed by right-wing groups or left-wing groups uh, exclusively at all, not at all. Um, and here, you know, uh, from the Katz Nelson text, this is uh, a famous photo of Rosa Parks uh, sitting on the bus in Montgomery, Alabama. Uh, this then led to a Supreme Court case in her favor. Um, discussed in Katz Nelson, discussed in Lowy, says the issue of abortion. Uh, and here you have some um, apparently students here uh, noting that they um, you know, vote pro life first. So this might be an example of putting. Uh, social interests even ahead of your own economic interests, uh, which some of us do. Uh, but anyway, carrying on here, mobilizing public opinion is another thing that interest groups try to do. They try to pressure politicians by mobilizing public opinion. Uh, so groups can seek to go public. We, we've talked about how presidents go public, um, but groups, interest groups can do this too. Uh, launching a media campaign to build popular support, not nearly as successful uh, as uh, presidents when doing so, but nonetheless, it is a strategy that's there. Uh, other strategies to, for mobilization can include advertising campaigns, protests, grassroots, grassroots lobbying, um, which is where you know non-lobbyists try to lobby. Uh, this would be grassroots lobbying. An, an example might be, again, the <coughs> March for Our Lives uh, students. <coughs> but ultimately, the idea is to get <coughs> other people uh, in the broader public to pressure officials along with interest groups. Excuse me, my throat's rather dry. <coughs> but here you see holding protests. This um, um, is uh, from an earlier edition of the textbook. This was um, teacher unions, strong schools equal strong neighborhoods. Um, we can look to other examples uh, going back to the Tea Party. This is from the Katz Nelson text. The Tea Party. Uh, sprung up after uh, Obama's election in 2008, and then kind of, sort of, has disappeared um, as of, uh, you know, even by the, the 2020 election and beyond. Uh, we don't hear much about the Tea Party per se anymore, but for a while it looked to be a pretty influential uh, group that was uh, always ready to protest. Um, but let's think about other forms of influence. We can uh, think about the electoral process and how fundraising is influential and how political action committees are private groups that raise and distribute funds for use in election campaigns. Uh, as of 2014, these groups, we call them PACs, political action committees, contributed nearly half a billion dollars uh, to political uh, campaign politics, electoral politics. Um, these are often independent expenditures, or these are independent expenditures. Groups spend money to engage voter education. And as long as PACs or PACs aren't coordinated with a campaign, uh, there are ways that spending in this category can be unlimited, which again, I'm not a big fan of. It's a lot of outside money, sometimes called dark money, that's spent uh, in support of a candidate, or often uh, not so much for in support of a candidate, but against another. Um, and again, as long as there's no coordination with the campaign itself, the Supreme Court has decided that this type of spending is perfectly legal. And thus, thus, right, the decision that made such spending legal happened in 2010. And you can see uh, from the Lowy text, this is on 406 of uh, the newest edition of the text. And you can see this number has just gone up and up and up, right? Uh, it goes down a bit during uh, off-year elections congressional elections, but really peaks and peaks and peaks again 
in presidential election years, right? Um, you have outside interests with a, a clear uh, desire to see one person elected over another, right? And that, and again, the spending occurs um, on both sides of the aisle are, are people of, of you know, left-leaning sentiment and right-leaning sentiment. It's just a consequence of the system that we live in. Um, here you see, this is also from the Lowy text, pages 404, 405. Um, the spending, again, skyrockets uh, after the, the Citizens United, excuse me, decision in 2010. And while since then, uh, Republican spending or conservative spending seems to uh, outpace uh, liberal spending in the 2020 election cycle, we saw liberal spending um, uh, outpace conservative spending. So again, um, you know, if you think money in politics is not a great thing, um, you know, don't don't point fingers because it's uh, it's a bipartisan affair. Um, anyway, interest group influence uh, again with activism uh, in electoral politics. Groups participate in electoral politics other than by making contributions to candidates, groups can be involved in get out the vote, GOTV, we talked about that before, get out the vote efforts, um, particularly with say unions working on behalf of Democrats, uh, we find, um, we can find uh, the other side of the aisle, uh, often say, um, you know, evangelical uh, Protestant groups trying to get uh, people registered to vote and then to vote. Uh, on behalf of Republicans, overwhelmingly. Uh, interest groups some, some, sometimes sponsor ballot initiatives, particularly in California, which we've talked about to circumvent legislative opposition to their goals. Um, and, you know, historically, there's been some success in that in California. Um, here's the in brief summary deal uh, from page 407 of the current edition of Lowy, but again, I'll leave this in here for you to consult as you need it. Lastly, uh, are interest groups effective, right? Uh, the evidence is surprisingly mixed, right? Some research has found, and this is according to Lowy, that advocacy rarely yields returns, while other research has found that um, corporations can uh, spend a small amount of money, um, or has found that the small amount of money corporations spend on advocacy is a sign that it is not worth that much to them. However, really, if group spending, if advocacy did not work, groups would not spend any money at all, right? I mean, that's just how capitalism works, right? If you feel like you're throwing money down a black hole, you, you're probably going to stop doing that, right? So the fact that the spending keeps going up and up and up leads me to believe um, that evidence is less mixed than Lowy might want to think, right? Um, money in the political system in the United States is here to stay, uh, at least in the short to medium term. So there it is. Anyway, uh, sorry about the extra slide uh, from Van Vechten, uh, but there it is. Done for now. Take care of yourselves. Be in touch as you need. Don't forget to take the test by the end of the week. Bye-bye.